there, and welcome back to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today we're going to continue with our exciting story of the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. This is story two, titled A Little Boy and a Little Girl. In the big town, where there are so many houses and people that there isn't enough room for everybody to have a little garden and where in consequence most people have to content themselves with flowers in pots. There were two poor children who had a garden somewhat bigger than a flower pot. They weren't brother and sister but they were as fond of each other as if they had been. Their parents were near neighbors living in two attics where the roof of the one house touched the other, and the gutter ran along the eaves. A small window in each house faced the other one. You had only to step across the gutter, and you could get from one window to the other. The parents had, each of them, a large wooden box. Outside the window and in it grew kitchen herbs, which they used, and also a little rose tree. There was one in each box, and they flourished wonderfully. Then the parents thought of putting the boxes across the gutter in such a way that they reached almost from one window to the other and really looked like two bunches of flowers. The pea plants hung down over the boxes, and the rose tree put out long branches and twined about around the windows and bent over to meet each other and made almost a triumphal mark of leaves and blossoms. The boxes were very high up and the children knew they must not climb up into them, but they were often allowed to go out and to meet each other and sit on their little stools beneath the roses. And there they used to play very happily. In the winter, of course, that pleasure was gone. The windows were often quite frozen over, but then they would heat little copper pennies on the stove and then put the hot pennies on the frosty pane. And there came a beautiful peephole, <laughs> as round as round, behind which peeped out a blessed little kind eye, one out of each of the windows, the little boys and the little girls. He was called Kay and she Gerda. In summer, they would get to each other with a single jump. In winter, they had first to go down a lot of stairs and then up a lot of stairs while the snow came drifting down outside. Those are the white bees swarming, said the old grandmother. Have they got a queen too? Asked the little boy, for he knew that the real bees have one. Indeed they have, said grandmother. She flies where they swarm the thickest. She's the biggest of them all, and she never stays still on the ground, but flies up again into the black cloud. Many a winter night she flies through the streets of the town and creeps in at the windows, and then they freeze into wonderful patterns like flowers. Yes, I've seen that, said both the children, and they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen get in here? asked the little Gerda. Let her come, said the little boy, and I'll put her on the hot stove, and she'll pff, melt. But Grandmother stroked his hair and told him stories about other things. In the evening, when little Kay was at home and half undressed, he climbed up on the stool by the window and peeked through the little hole. A few snowflakes were falling outside, and one of them, the biggest of them all, remained lying in a corner in one of the flower boxes. This flake grew larger and larger and at last turned into the complete shape of a lady. Dressed in the finest white gauze, which seemed to be made out of millions of star-shaped flakes. She was very pretty and delicate, but she was of ice, blinding, dazzling ice, yet she was alive. Her eyes gazed out like two bright stars, but there was no rest or quietness in them. She nodded towards the window 
and back it with her hand. The little boy was frightened and jumped down off the stool. And then it seemed as if a large bird flew past the window. Hmm. Next day was clear and frosty. And then came a thaw. And after that came springtime. And the sun shone. And the green buds peeped forth. And the swallows built their nests. The windows were open. And the children sat once more in their little garden high up in the gutter of the topmost story. That summer, the roses blossomed as never before. The little girl had learned to hem, in which there was something about roses. And at the mention of them, she thought of her own. And she sang the hymn to the little boy, and he sang it too. The roses grow in the valley, where we meet the Jesus child. The little ones held each other by the hand and kissed the roses and gazed into God's bright sunshine and spoke to it as if the child Jesus was there. What lovely summer days were those, and how blessed it was to be out among the fresh rose bushes, which seemed as if they would never leave off blossoming. Kay and Gerda were sitting looking at a picture book with beasts and birds in it, and then just as the clock in the great church tower was striking five, Kay said, Oh, something pricked my heart. Oh, and I've just, I've got something in my eye. The little girl put her arm around his neck and he winked his eye. But no, there was nothing to be seen. I think it's gone, he said. But it wasn't. It was one of those tiny bits that were broken off the glass. The troll glass, you remember, about that, that horrid glass, which made everything great and good that was reflected in it become mean and ugly, while the evil, nasty things came out, and every blemish was plain to be seen. <gasps> oh, poor Kay. He had got a piece of it right in his heart, which would soon be like a lump of ice. For the moment, it wasn't doing any harm. Still, it was there. What are you crying for? He asked. It makes you look horrid. There's nothing the matter with me. <laughs> he called out suddenly. That rose there, that's worm-eaten. And look at that other. It's all crooked. Rotten roses after all, like the boxes they're in. And with that, he gave the box a hard kick and pulled off two of the roses. What are you doing, Kay? cried the little girl. And when he saw she was frightened, he pulled off a third rose and ran at his own window, leaving dear little Gerda. Later, when she brought him the picture book, he said, hmm, it was only fit for babies. And when grandmother told him stories, he was always breaking in with a but. And if he could, he would follow her about with spectacles on and imitate her talking. It was exactly like and made people laugh. Very soon he would imitate and walk and talk of everybody in the street. Everything that was odd or not nice about them, Kay could mimic. And people said, that boy's got an uncommon wit to be sure. But it was the bit of glass he had got in his eye and the bit he had in his heart. And so it came about that he would tease even little Gerda, who loved him with all her heart. The games he played were quite different now. They were very clever. One winter day, when the snowflakes were drifting down, he brought out a big magnifying glass and held out the corner of his blue jacket, and he let the flakes fall on it. Now look through the glass, Gerda, he said. And there was every flake made much bigger and looking like a beautiful flower or a ten-pointed star. It was lovely to see. Look how clever it is, said Kay. It's much more interesting than the real flowers are. And there's not a single thing wrong with them. They're perfectly accurate. If 
only they didn't melt. A little later, Kay came in with big mittens on, and his sledge hung on his back, and he shouted to Gerda, right in her ear, I've got to leave to drive in the big square where the others are playing. And he was off. Out there in the square, the boldest of the boys often used to tie their sledges to a farmer's cart and drive a good long way with it. It was excellent fun. At the height of their sport, a large sledge came by. It was painted white all over. And in it, someone wrapped in a shaggy white fur and wearing a shaggy cap. This sledge drove twice round the square. And little Kay made haste and tied his own little sledge to it and drove off. Faster and faster it went into the next street. The driver turned his head and nodded to Kay in a friendly way. Hmm. It seemed as if they knew each other. Every time Kay thought of loosing his sledge, the driver nodded again. So Kay stayed where he was, and they drove right out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall, so thick that the boy couldn't see his hand before him as he drove on. And he hastily loosened the rope so as to let go of the big sledge, but it made no difference. His little trap held fast to it, and it went like the wind. He called out loudly, but no one heard, and the snow drifted down and the sledge flew onward. Sometimes it made a bound, as if it were going over ditches or fences. He was in a dreadful fright. He tried to say the Lord's Prayer, but he could only remember the multiplication table. The snowflakes grew bigger and bigger, till at last they looked like large white hens. Suddenly they parted. The big sledge pulled up, and the person who was driving in it rose. The fur and the cap were all of snow. It was a lady, tall and slender, shining white. The Snow Queen. We have traveled well, she said, <laughs> but you mustn't freeze. Creep into my bear skin. She put him beside her in the sledge, and he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? She asked and kissed him on the forehead. Ugh, it was colder than ice and stuck ah, straight into his heart, which itself was almost a lump of ice. He felt as if he were dying. But only for a moment, then all was right, and he didn't notice the cold about him anymore. My sledge! Don't leave my sledge behind! That was the first thing he remembered. So it was tied on to one of the white hens, which flew after them with his sledge on its back. Once more, the Snow Queen kissed Kay, and he had forgotten little Gerda and grandmother and everyone at home. <clears throat> no more kisses now, she said, or I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. Very pretty she was. Cleverer, fair face, he could not imagine. She didn't seem now to be of ice, as she was when she sat outside the window and beckoned him. In his eyes, she was perfect and he felt no fear. He told how he knew mental arithmetic, and with fractions too, and the areas of the country, and how many inhabitants. And she smiled all the time, till he thought that what he knew didn't come to much. He gazed up into the immense spaces of the air, and she flew on with him, flew high, among the dark clouds and the storm wind whistled and roared as if it were singing old ballads. Over forest and lake they flew, and over sea and land, below them the cold blast whistled, and wolves, oh, 
howled and snow sparkled. And above them flew the black cawing crows. Ah, ah. But over all shone the moon, large and bright. And by its light, Kay watched through the long, long winter night. By day, he slumbered at the feet of the Snow Queen. <laughs> and that's the second story of the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. Be sure to join us for the next video where we'll read story three. And until then, happy story time. Bye.